This is the BBC. Hello, I'm Linda McCauley and welcome to this podcast of On Your Behalf. I'm Linda McCauley and on your behalf this week, blue badges. Perhaps you or a family member has one. Rebecca got a penalty ticket for parking her sister's wheelchair accessible van in a loading bay. So where does your blue badge allow you to park? And are spaces for disabled parking fit for purpose? I look forward to hearing your views on that one. And remember only fools and horses. Well, of course, Del Boy and Rodney, they're all chancers. But Marlene is on the programme because despite all those years living with Boise, she's fallen for scam, that is the actress Sue, who now plays the part. And she wants to tell people how to avoid scams. So she and Action Fraud have launched Scam Bingo and victim support are in the studio sharing how people feel when they've been scammed. Are they feeling ashamed or stupid? Let me know again if it's happened to you. And here's how you get in touch. Email oyb at bbc.co.uk or tweet me at Consumer Linda. Now, I think most people know what having a blue badge means. It helps you park closer to your destination, either as a passenger or as a driver. Only though for on-street parking, off-street private car parks like hospitals or supermarket car parks have separate rules, but they often have designated spaces. But there are still rules about where you can and can't park. Now, Rebecca thought she was a bit of an expert on the rules because for years she's been taking her sister Lucy out in her specially converted van. My eldest sister, Lucy, is um, severely disabled. She was born prematurely and has had severe cerebral palsy her whole life. Um, Can't bear any weight. She's in a a specialist electric chair. You know, nothing's ever going to change. That's the the situation. So um, the van that we were using is my parents' van. Lucy still lives with my parents. So it's a converted Volkswagen van with a a uh, ramp that comes out the back of it and we were going to the pantomime at the Grand Opera House and the the Christmas markets um in December and yeah trying to find a space and of course you you know about blue badges and about where you can and can't use them you know this, this isn't new to you no you know as I said Lucy's 35 now this year you know we've had it her her whole life as long as blue badges have been in existence and things so um yeah you know we would be pretty confident in knowing and and even where to check you know where we can park which was the ni direct website which i used so you know what you're at and this was a lovely outing i imagine before christmas i mean i was at the pantomime it was great fun but the city was very busy i i i I can understand why you were struggling to find a parking space yes completely you know uh multi-story car parks aren't really suitable they're also not really any close to the city hall or the grand opera house so yeah we had already done a couple of looks trying to to find somewhere um and then the the space on lennon hall street we spotted it double checked on the website yes second bullet point said we were exempt parked in it and off we went for our our day out this was a loading bay was it yeah and you checked that on the website. and you packed it, In fact, you got a screenshot of it. Yeah, a screenshot from the day, uh, you know, screenshot it on the 18th of December, whenever, which was the day we parked there. And off you went confidently that you were going to go to the market and go to the opera house and come back and all the rest of it. You must have been quite gunked to, to, to find the ticket on the, on the windscreen. Couldn't believe it, Linda, in all honesty. You know, you know that feeling when, your you know your gut just sinks whenever you see a, any sort of ticket you know on your car but yeah just completely shocked and it put a total dampener you know on what had been a really great day and of course you need that extra space because uh, for, for your sister you have to get the back doors open and a ramp and all the rest of it you can't just park in, in any disabled spot it has to be extra space so did you challenge it yes i challenged it uh, the next day <laughs> um i'm someone that's you know, I'm quite an activist in terms of blue badges and things like that. So the very next day I got the ticket, got the, the website address off the ticket to appeal or challenge, um, whatever the, the right term is. Took a number of photos, sorry, on the, the night as well of, you know, where we were parked, the signage, what was around us, that kind of stuff. 
uh, did the, the challenge, sent the, the screenshot from the NI Direct website saying blue badges were exempt, sent them the photos, listed about four or five bullet points of the reasons why I was challenging it. Things like, could they give me a list of other public spaces that were suitable for Lucy if a loading bay wasn't one of them? Why did the NI Direct website say we were exempt if we weren't that? You know, I raised a number of, of valid points um, when I, I challenged it and just got a notification then afterwards to say, OK, thanks, we've received your, your challenge and someone will come back to you, you know, in due course. And that, that's how I left it at the time. And what happened? It got rejected. And to be honest, I was in awe that they could even have denied it, that it was in black and white, or black and white that, you know, second bullet point on the list that blue badges were exempt in loading bays. They never answered any of my questions that I had raised around, you know, where else could we park? Where was it publicly listed? You know, where we could park, that kind of stuff. They quite clearly just gave me a copy and paste of, some you know generic text that they use for repeals that are appeals that are being rejected saying that no blue badges weren't exempt here's a copy of the the blue badge exemptions here's the and, and the the link they gave me for that was the ni direct website and that's when i discovered that they had removed the blue badge holders bullet point from the exemption list because I went and checked the the link they had given me in the rejection notice and they had just gone and taken out that bullet point even though at the time and I still have the screenshot in black and white that blue badges were allowed to park there. What are your options now? I mean obviously if you don't pay it it's going to escalate. I sent another email just saying I wasn't going to accept this. They still hadn't answered my questions about suitable parking for Lucy's style of converted van. Uh, no answers to why the NI Direct website was changed. You know, if there was a mistake on their part, you know, that's not my fault. At the time I parked there, the fact was it was in black and white that I, I was allowed to park there. But they've rejected that that second case again. So, yeah, like there is a time limit on it. And it is, you know, in this discount period of getting the, the reduced price off the ticket. Well, we contact the Department for Infrastructure about Rebecca and Lucy's experience. They say Rebecca was right. There was a mistake on their website, but it wasn't for private cars. It was under the parking restrictions for goods vehicles. Rebecca's ticket was for Code 25. That's a non-goods vehicle. So the mistake that she saw doesn't actually affect her ticket. A spokesperson for the department confirmed that there are no exemptions for blue badge holders to park in loading bays. And the mistake on the website has now been corrected. Rebecca says she decided just to pay the ticket rather than continue her appeal and risk the fine getting even bigger. The department says say if someone like Rebecca has had an appeal denied but still wants to challenge the parking ticket, they can do so through a representation. And if that's unsuccessful, they can go to the Northern Ireland Traffic Penalty uh, Tribunal. Well, regardless of the rights and wrongs in this case, what is the situation for blue badge holders trying to park in towns and cities across Northern Ireland? And I'm aware blue badge Badges are a hot potato and I'm sure we'll get lots of questions and comments already coming in. 30 30 80 55 55, text 81771. And I'm expecting uh, comments from people who use them and people who don't, who have different views. And with me to deal with all of that is Nuala Toman of Disability Action. She's with me in the studio. Thanks, Nuala, for coming in. And Dermot Devlin of IMTAC. Uh, Dermot is a wheelchair user. He's joining us from his home in Oma. I'll come to you in a moment, uh, Dermot. But Nuala, is it confusing the regulations around blue badges? There's no doubt the information that is available on the NI Direct website is confusing. Um, it's presented in a series of tables. Um, some parts of the website link to other parts. And really, if we are to fully meet accessibility standards, then all information should be clearly presented in in a single accessible space. Well, now, of course, uh, the department say that when you get your blue badge, that they send out all the information on the parking exemptions to the blue badge holder when they get their badge. So they're saying you've got that information. But regardless of that, when you go out onto the street and start trying to find a space. It's incredibly challenging to find accessible 
park in, in, in you know, if we use Belfast City uh, as an example, information is available in in different settings. For example, the Belfast City Council website does list where there are accessible bays available. There are 46 listed on that site. Is that, um, all? Is that all? 46. And that's for a city that has a population of 250,000 and a reach of half a million. Um, recent statistics from the census show that one in four people are disabled people. So provision is much lower than what is required. Not all of those spaces are free spaces. Um, so there then is a need and requirement for people to check in advance if they're parking in a freely accessible place space or uh, an area in which they have to pay. And then there are other, obviously, places on street where people can park, but like anyone using the city, parking is a significant challenge. So you, you think there aren't enough uh, parking bays, but of course, especially for the wheelchair accessible vans, that's what uh, Lucy and her sister Rebecca, that's what they were trying to use. So in the case of wheelchair accessible vans, um, Disability Action would argue that the spaces that, that are provided at present and the size of those spaces are not sufficient. They need to, to be longer. Yes, they need to be longer because at the minute in certain situations you're expecting people to leave a wheelchair accessible van into oncoming traffic um, or very close to another parking space. And it can become very, very difficult for people to, you know, enter and exit their vans. You know, we would have a significant amount of our casework that is around disabled parking. And this issue is raised time and time again as a barrier to people who are reliant on wheelchair accessible vans for independent living, having severe challenges and finding places that can address their own particular requirements. Alan's, uh, I'm not sure if he texted or emailed, but you can text or email 81771OYB at bbc.co.uk or 0303 805555. Alan says blue badges and wheelchair accessible vehicles are both life enhancing bits of kit and at the same time both have their irritations. Parking spaces, he says, most provision is for parallel parking, which assumes some degree of mobility and ability to transfer. He says the WAVs, that's the wheelchair accessible vehicle need longer bays but protected or indeed preference for nose on parking that's driving straight in I presume that's what that means he also says blue badges are a bit limited uh, need to be registered to the user in the car which sounds okay but if I needed an urgent run out to collect medication strictly I could not use the badge to speed things up well let me bring in Dermot Devlin of IMTAC the Inclusive Mobility and Transport Advisory Committee and also the uh, the, the uh, author if that's the right word of the excellent web website My Way Access. Dermot, good morning to you. I know this is a very familiar issue for you. Just just describe your own needs as a, as a, uh, when it comes to accessibility and getting out and about. Uh, good morning, Linda. Um, well, I myself am a keeper tall and I'm a, a wheelchair user. So when I'm sort of tramp, going maybe to Belfast or going on around Oma, I would have to use a rear access vehicle, you know, through either taxi or friends and family. Now, uh, uh, as, as we said earlier, uh, when I'm sort of exiting or get, trying to get back into the vehicle again, because of the, the long vehicle, it's very hard to get the correct space because there's not, there's not, there's not a wide enough space for that type of vehicle. Um, while you might get a uh, parking space to park in, when you come back, there could be another vehicle parked behind you, which means that uh, you can't get the the one put back down to get back into. So it is a very serious issue, you know, particularly as, say, um, you know, when disabled people want to go into the town and service the shop or to, to, to do their business. Well, I know that you, you're involved in, in, in IMTAC, as I said, the Inclusive Mobility and Transport Advisory Committee. And the department says that if there are requests for more blue badge holding holder spaces in specific locations, you can make them to, to the divisional traffic management teams. I'm quite sure IMTAC has done that, have you? Well, it's, it's something that we would have ongoing conversations with, with the Department of Infrastructure to, uh, to ensure that there are more spaces um, you know, just to highlight where they need to be and sort of things like that then. I, um, uh, we are making some sort of 
for that and getting more spaces. But as I say, it, currently it's not enough in town and cities, and mainly we're getting them when it comes to redevelopment of cities and town, you know, sort of like um, when they're developing new areas or improving areas that we would make the request that there's more spaces to be put in for disabled people. Of course, there are regulations on where you can and can't park, and I'm sure people will be listening who, who don't have a blue badge or a blue badge user in their family who will say that if you've got a blue badge, people think they've got the, the right to throw the badge at the front of the car and, and park the car anywhere they're like. That's actually not true, isn't it? There are limitations to where you can and can't park. Yeah, um, for example, um, you can park on a, a double yellow lane, but just for three years, but it can't be anywhere near a junction. You know, I think it's about 50 metres away from junction because that will cause obstruction. And as I said, I did it for three years. Now, I, I know earlier that you can't park on a, a loading bay, which obviously makes sense. But, you know, the mistake was on the NI Direct website. So, again, that's something that really needs to be looked at. But, well, that's um, actually all been sorted, and the mistake was on the on the goods vehicle bit and not on the private bit. But, but leaving all that aside, you're quite right. It needs to be needs to be clear. It needs to be clear because, as Nila said earlier, like, I've been looking up the, the websites since I've been uh, made aware of this issue, and it's not the easiest uh, site to follow with, with regard to where where you can park. But outside of that, you know, there are spaces, and um, you know, there does need to be more. Now, the, uh, the DFA traffic attention is usually quite good for tackling these issues. Um, hopefully, it was a redevelopment coming in Belfast and was in Oman and different towns uh, across the country that um, there should be more spaces. But again, uh, if you feel in your area there needs to be more, that you can, you can contact your, your local council to make the request for the, the DFA. Nula uh, Toman Disability Action. The, that's we're talking about on street parking. There's always a lot of rows as well in car parks and supermarkets and places like that. Uh, who who enforces or maybe doesn't enforce? You know, you know, you see the mother and child or parent and child's a better word and uh, you know uh, wheelchair access. Are they enforceable? So those um, private car parks are subject to different regulations and they tend to be then managed by the the private setting so there are kind of monitored and done by is undertaken then by private businesses but in the kind of context of private uh, spaces I think again it's going back to that issue that was raised already around provision um, because we remain in this um, situation whereby you know provision is made on the basis of um, really car access rather than wheelchair accessible vans and these issues become all the more challenging within private car parks because of the the regulations and the, the space within private spaces and the way in which um, car park traffic um, proceeds, you know, proceeds around. Um, I guess if we're going to resolve any of these issues, um, it's around commencing design on the basis of the principles of universal design where if you get things right for disabled people And then um, you've you got to think about pedestrians and you've got to think about cyclists and you've got to think about drivers There's an awful lot of people saying, what about me? And if you go along the the principles of universal design, that is taking into account everyone's needs All and users. thinking about how we provide infrastructure parking roads that are fully accessible by all who need them and um, we always say if you get it right for disabled people you get it right for for everyone. And Dermot we're not getting it right then are we? Uh, sorry to repeat that. We're not getting it right uh, you, would agree, you would you would agree with Nuller we're not getting it right? We're not getting it right at the moment but we are sort of making sort of progress but to say most people when as you mentioned earlier when they look at uh, wheelchair spaces, they think of, well, it's just, you know, way to get into money or why is it so near the shop and stuff like that. It's it just to get near the shop to make it easier. But what people don't appreciate is it, it's not just about, you know, getting near. It's about, you know, providing the adequate space to get the wheelchair in and out of the vehicle safely, you know, that you're not sort of going on to traffic. Because it is important beside these um, 
parking bay or the, the disabled parking bay that they need to be dropped down curbs as well because you could be put onto busy roads. So it is a, a big project that needs to be looked at. Um, and as Nilla said, you know, if you get it right for deaf and disabled people, you get it right for everybody because that's what it's about is equality and equity. I was looking at your website this morning, My Way Access. Great information there if you are planning a visit somewhere. If you you can click on the icon and see what the parking facilities are at that particular place. That's a very useful uh, uh, tool to have. And it would be great also if you could click on on that kind of thing and find out where there were these uh, wh- wheelchair access vans, accessible vans. That would be useful too. That definitely would. You know, we're trying to get as much of this information out that makes it easier for people to find out where and where they can go and, you know, and to plan their journey, journey accordingly. Dermot, thanks for joining us this morning. Dermot Devlin speaks for IMTAC and also very familiar with the, with the problems facing people both in wheelchairs and in uh, wheelchair accessible vans and Nula Toman of Disability Action. Thank you too for coming into the studio this morning. And talking of trans-